been doing my whole career is to get, try to simplify things. I don't like complicated things because I just don't like complicated things. I, I like simplicity. Um, and when you look at machine learning, uh, there's a lot of complexity. And there's a lot of like complicated math. And what I'm going to uh, tell you today is that really it's all like kindergarten math. Everything that you get like learned in high school or elementary school and um, will tell you a lot about like why machine learning works. Um, and it's also a lot of fun kind of, like programming tricks involved. I actually I think the programming tricks are more interesting than the math. Um, People may know that I got like, you know, after I uh, worked for Microsoft, then I tried startup, then I have joined Facebook. I currently, uh, at Facebook, we have a group that works on using machine learning to make developers more productive. Um, there's a, two blog posts that recently came out, one uh, that describes some of the work, and one is about uh, test selection, um, and the other one is about automatic bug fixing. So now at Facebook we have um, programs that find bugs using traditional static analysis, and then we have ML-based uh, programs that fix the bugs for you. Um, and um, so I think that's uh, like super cool. And what I'm going to show you today is like a little bit of the uh, like magic behind the scenes. Um, to go a little bit uh, like you know back in my career. Um, I used to be an academic, um, and then I had to teach software engineering. And I was teaching software engineering, but I felt like a vegetarian butcher. Um, and VB, like I worked on VB afterwards, so that is kind of like an appropriate thing to think. But I was kind of like teaching software engineering, and I had no clue how people wrote um, big programs in practice. And what I discovered is two things, two things that I learned like, you know, when I moved from academia to get, like, you know, work on code in the real world. And the first one is that the machines that we program are not mathematical abstractions. They are physical machines. And so uh, before they get, like, in the talk, somebody came up and said, thank you, Eric, for all your lectures on functional programming. I, I was very polite to this uh, gentleman, but I don't think functional programming um, adheres to this principle. If you think about Haskell, where people look at the world as like, you know, this pure abstraction, you kind of forget that, you know, the machine is actually kind of like, you know, not a pure thing. It has an L2 cache. It has kind of like, you know, a memory hierarchy. You have to communicate between two machines, which is orders of magnitude um, uh, slower than kind of like, you know, get, getting something from a register. And ultimately, if your code becomes popular, if it becomes useful, it has to become fast. So this is why I often say, think like a fundamentalist. So you can still do functional programming in your mind, but you have to code like a hacker. Because your code gets successful, your product gets successful, it has to run fast. So programming is not a fairy tale where you can put, or maybe it is a fairy tale, but you put all the things on top, you still feel that kind of like thing uh, below. Um, and then the next thing is the, if you think about software methodology, working software over following a plan, right? Ultimately, it's about producing software. Um, and code is the currency. So it's all about code. It's all about producing code, modifying code, editing code, refactoring code, and then, of course, pushing it um, as quickly out to production as possible. Um, when I was talking about this um, a few years ago, people were like, what? But now everybody's doing continuous deployment and continuous integration. So this is not that strange of a, a point of view anymore. Um, however, after, I mean, this year, software engineering is, it has its 50th birthday. Um, so for 50 years, we have been thinking about writing code. And I don't know how long we have had these, the, the, the go-to conference, Yao, before that. And we're still here. Like, you know, look at how many people are here. Like 1,600 people are here for nearly a full week, and maybe a full week if they do the workshops, because they want to learn how to write code. 
or how to write better code or how to better write code, whatever permutation you want. That's kind of like, you know, a little bit disappointing. It's like, why can't we write code? Maybe we as humans are just not smart enough to write code. Um, and maybe we should look at other things in society. We, we are not strong enough to dig holes, so we can kind of like invent machines to dig the holes for us. And then if we want to kind of like, you know, do physical stuff, well, we go to the gym, we do it for fun. Maybe we should dis do the same thing for code. Right? Maybe we are just not good at writing code. Why are we trying so hard? Why don't we just admit, I'm only human, I cannot write code. Okay? And just let the machines do that for us. And this is something that I kind of like, you know, I realized a few years ago, or a few years ago, yeah, a few years ago. And then last year, I kind of like, you know, I started this new team that's completely focused on machine learning. I threw away all the old stuff, programming languages, all that stuff, not interesting. The future is letting machines do the work. Um, and I think that it won't take 50 years for the machines to become better at programming than we are. So I want to take you on this little journey um, down the rabbit hole of machine learning. Um, this is like, you know, that's me, and that's the white rabbit that I'm, that kind of like, you know, that I'm going to follow. Now, I'm not the only one that says this. There were a couple of talks about machine learning in, in this conference, um, and people call this like a very sexy title, Software 2.0, right? So the, a lot of the stuff that you're doing in your day job is Software 1.0, but like JavaScript frameworks, you know, also programming evolves, and people are talking about Software 2.0, and Software 2.0 is, um, and usually it's got like, you know, focused on deep learning, where you train a neural net, you train the weights of a neural net um, by giving it examples, and it will kind of like, you know, learn this function um, to do what you want it to do. So this is the difference maybe for like a normal terminology for regular people. Um, software 1.0 is we have humans turning coffee into code. Um, and software 2.0, is instead we're taking data and we have some magic, which is not so magic, um, and turn that into a model. Now, machine learning people, that's one of the reasons that machine learning can look so intimidating. They like to use expensive words. I don't like expensive words, but, um, and that's what I will kind of like, you know, um, help you to get like dispel a lot of those expensive words. But there is something into this, like model, you can say, yeah, it's just code. But there's something uh, like really special about the model. Um, namely, that as human programmers, we're often over-promise and under-deliver. If we look at a function that we write, or you know, a Java class or a method, it says, oh, this thing takes a string and returns an integer. And in some sense, we're lying. Because this thing is kept like often making a guess. It might return an error, or it may not have, like it might have bugs. So when we give this, this specification of a function like that, we're kind of like literally over-promising and under-delivering. If you look at what the model does, it says, oh, this is a cat with this probability and a dog with that probability and a bowl of guacamole with such probability. So these models are honest about the fact that they're guessing. And I think that's very liberating. So even if you get, like, want to forget about all this machine learning stuff, I think thinking in terms of like uncertainty and ha allowing your program to get like express the fact that you're uncertain about the outcome is a very powerful notion. Um, now, instead of code, the new currency, or as people say, the new oil, is data. All right? So we're not writing code anymore. We're gathering data. Um, then we're cleaning it and get like you know transforming it, normalizing it. And then we're using that to train a machine model or we're kind of like using it for visualization. So um, instead of code as the artifact, um, data is the kind of like new thing that, that we value. And here's an example. This is the simplest of the simplest, the hello world of machine learning. Um, you get a bunch of features of flowers. And now you have to predict what kind of flower that is. 
Um, and here I show you also the difference between what a regular programmer would do. Um, he would say, like, okay, I, I define a method that takes a flower, description of a flower, and gives you a string which says this is the flower. But the machine learning, we're a little bit more modest. We give you a probability distribution. So if you look at this thing, it's like the, the algorithm looks at that flower and says, ah, I think it's a Citosa. It could also be this other one or that other one. Uh, for the middle one, it says, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the, the versicolor. I'm pretty sure. You can see that if you look at the distribution. And if you look at the last one, um, that's supposed to be a flower that looks a little bit like the both of them. My drawing skills are not so great, but you know, hopefully you see that this guy like, has a little bit of both. Um, and you see that the distribution, is, it's not so certain what flower it is. And the same thing when you got like, you know, recognizing cats and dogs. Now, you can think it's like, you know, ah, you know, flowers, recognizing animals. Um, but I would give you, um, I don't know, like 10 million Danish crowner. You could not write these functions using traditional um, um, programming languages or traditional techniques. No matter what methodology you use, no matter how well you listen to Dan, you cannot write this in the traditional way. The only way you can solve this problem is using machine learning. So this is also something like, you know, I don't think software 1.0 will disappear, but um, software 2.0, machine learning, opens a whole new class of applications that we can write and that we couldn't do before. And we all know this, you open your iPhone, you take a picture, whenever it draws a box around the face of somebody, that's a machine learned algorithm that you couldn't write by hand. So again, even if you don't believe in software 2.0, look at it anyway, because you know it allows you to solve problems that you couldn't solve before. And I think that's always a good thing. Um, but as I said, what I want to, what, what attracts me is the fact that even if I wanted to, I could not write these, um, these algorithms that I just showed you, or these problems that I just showed you, using traditional um, techniques. Now, how do you have turn data into code? And it's relatively simple. This is the, like the magic behind that. You take your training data, which contains input-output pairs. Um, it's a little bit like TDD, right? I, 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 I'll give you kind of like a whole bunch of, kind of like examples. Um, and then you split them in the input and output. You feed the input to your model, and that model is parameterized by weights. You compute the guess, and again, this thing just guesses, and it's honest about that. Then you compare the guess with the output, and you compute the difference, um, which is also interesting. If you look at like you know Java or C Sharp or whatever, if you compare two things, it only you know, you can only return minus one, zero, or one. It's kind of also quite limiting, right? Because maybe it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, they're kind of the same. So you want to return like something that is not just like zero, minus one, or, or one. Yeah, just give like a little bit of like, you know, it's kind of the same. That's what this loss function does, all right? And then based on that loss function, on the outcome of that, you adjust the weights. Um, and then you rinse and repeat um, and then you're, uh, until you can like minimize the error. So that's how you, what people mean by training. Um, now what's interesting is the way that people can like, you know, check how well this neural net is doing is by taking the training data and separating it into a test set and a training set. And I don't understand why we don't do this for regular developers. If I'm kind of like giving a developer a task and I say, here's a set of tests, I should keep like 30% of those tests in my back pocket. Let the developer kind of like, you know, build their program and then kind of like, you know, really check it on the tests that they have never seen. Um, but I don't know why we don't um, uh, take this technique um, from, from what the people do in machine learning. Um, anyway, uh, now, what, how do you find the minimum of a function? Well, that's, it sounds, magic, but then you think about, hmm, in high school, we learned something. We, we learned that in order to find the minimum of a function, that's where the derivative is zero. Everybody remembers that? Yes? Well, that's the whole trick 
that these machine learning people use. So if we go back to this picture, in order to get, like, you know, minimize, find the, the, the spot where this, the loss function, the error is minimized, I have to be able to differentiate the thing in that yellow box. Now, that yellow box is composed of layers and neurons, but if you think about it as a computer scientist, those are just functions, and actually they're pure functions. So if functional programming is going to win, it's because it's hidden in that yellow box of a neural network. Because these are pure functions, because the neural network doesn't do any I.O., it doesn't do anything. Um, it's just computing, uh, like from the inputs, it computes the outputs. And then there's something special. It's a pure function, but it's differentiable. Um, and so the real trick to do deep learning is to make functions differentiable or to understand how, do you, how you differentiate functions. Um, and I don't believe really, and, and you, uh, I won't say it here in this today, but I don't think that neural networks have anything to do with what happens in the brain. Um, it's just a bunch of multiplications and additions, and um, that works really well on GPUs. But I don't think we have, like, you know, we do addition and multiplication in our brain. Um, but it still works, right? But I, I just don't, get, like, you know, I don't think that these things are intelligent. You just feed them examples and they learn from it by updating these weights. So I'm not going to get, like, you know, make any claims about AI. Um, so we're moving from the world of software 1.0, where the humans do the work, to the work of software 2.0, where we can get, like, you know, lay under the tree thinking big thoughts. Um, and we just feed data into this um, ML thing and out comes a model. So here's a kind of like, you know, the actual implementation of the hello world. Um, so this is the kind of like, as I said, like this is the simplest of the simplest of the simplest neural networks. So there's the data. Somebody got, gathered the data. So there's features of the uh, flowers um, and um, the actual flower that kind of like, you know, has those features. Then you need to define a set of weights, and then you see there the model, it just kept like multiplies these weights and applies this ReLU function, and then in the end it applies a softmax, which turns it into the probability distribution. Um, and the deeper you, like the more of these layers you do, the deeper your neural network is. We all don't have to worry about that. I think there's one interesting thing here, um, and this is an interesting computer science problem is that these neural networks work in a continuous domain because you have to, this function, this model function here, has to be differentiable, all right? Now, all the structures that we have in our computers are discrete, customers, orders, flowers. Um, and just like with databases where we have the, o, uh, the object uh, relational impedance mismatch, where like a database is a table of rows and now you have to map your Java objects, your, your graph, into the relational tables, you have to do the same thing here. So our computational paradigm is kind of like, you know, kind of awkward. It didn't work for databases, it doesn't work for neural nets. So this, this uh, embedding there that goes from the discrete world to the continuous world is a big problem. And if you've seen uh, one of the previous talk about source D, where like, you know, doing deep learning on code, that's there also a big problem. You have like ASTs, how do you get map ASTs which are discrete into this continuous domain. I'm going to just wave my hands that we can solve that. So this, so really one way to look at um, a neural net is just a class where the weights are your instance variables, your model is a method, and by training, you initialize your instance variables. All right, so in some sense, it's, it's still very similar to what we've done for the last 50 years. It's just object-oriented programming where instead of initializing the, the, uh, the state, we learn the state. Um, so let's assume we can all do this and let's see how can we differentiate code. Um, and if you do that and you, you, you Google a little bit, you find a lot of, kind of like complicated papers. It's like, you know, um, there's this thing backprop as a functor that uses category theory to describe backpropagation. Oh my, strict symmetrical monoidal categories. Oh my goodness, I mean, that's not a topic for like the last talk of a conference, right? Um, then there's like, look at this one on the, on the uh, what is it? 
you're right. Look at all these Greek symbols. You cannot even get, like pronounce them. Okay, eh, way too hard. All right? For my brain, we need something really simple. Like my brain is the size of a peanut. We all know that. And we need really simple math. Um, and what I will show you is that it's like the, putting a garden hose on this dog, right? The dog looks really impressive. You spray it with the garden hose, and then it turns out that inside that big dog was a really little dog hiding. That's got not that impressive, and it's not that it doesn't look that uh, scary. Um, so let's take the next step in our journey. Um, we're uh, like we dove down the rabbit hole. And now we're going to look at how we're going to implement um, differentiation. And we're going to do that with uh, dual numbers. So dual numbers were invented by William Clifford in you know, somewhere between 1845 and 1879. So that's hundreds of years ago. And dual numbers are really kind of like quite remarkable. We all remember complex numbers, which is, by the way, like great naming, right? Complex numbers. Ooh, that must be really hard. Um, why would anybody call them? Co or imaginary numbers. Oh, they don't exist. Um, anyway, like whether you call them complex numbers, imaginary numbers. These are numbers A plus BI, where I squared equals minus one. All right? Now you think I squared equal minus one. Why? Why not? I, because I just kind of implemented I comparable. Then the three good values are minus one. Zero or one. So let's, what's, what happens when we take complex numbers and instead of i squared equals minus one, we take i squared equals zero? Obvious, right? Well, complex numbers were invented in 15 something, and then these dual numbers are just complex numbers with instead of i squared equals minus one, it equals zero. They were invented 300 years later. So it's maybe not that obvious, but for a computer scientist, it should be obvious. But it's just an arbitrary choice. Now, when you make that choice, you get something really, really amazing. Namely, that if you compute a function over a dual number, so if you compute f of a plus b epsilon, it computes f of a, so it computes the original value of that function applied to a, and the derivative. It computes it at the same time. Isn't that cool? Again, you don't have to understand how it works. I don't understand how it works. You just take complex numbers. Instead of i squared equals minus 1, you say i squared equals 0. To avoid confusion, we call i, I epsilon, because we have to uh, differentiate between them. And then we get this. Amazing. Amazing. So by just kept, like introducing this new form of numbers, we can just calculate, we compute the derivative. Now, this is all the math that you need. This is all the math that you need to understand deep learning. And guess what? This is math from 200 years ago, so it couldn't be that hard, because we're way smarter now, right? They didn't even have computers back then. They only have fountain pens. Um, now, if you really want to understand why this works, it's based on Taylor expansion. Now, Taylor expansion, that's really crazy stuff. All right? This Mr. Taylor discovered that you can take a function and you can write it as an infinite sum that kind of involves factorial and like you know exponentiation. That's really crazy. And it's like from 1715. It's like that's got like really cool stuff. Um, now I promised you I wouldn't do any category theory, but I cannot help myself. Um, so if you got like you know define this thing that lifts a function from normal values over dual numbers then it turns out that that thing, that function, is a functor. So, which means that t of f compose g is the same as t of f compose t of g, um, which is much nicer than the chain rule. I don't know if you remember the chain rule. I cannot remember it. I always have to find it on Wikipedia. But we don't, it turns out we don't need the chain rule because with dual numbers, it just follows from, from this fact that it's a functor. Now, these mathematicians are a little bit weird, right? They write a plus b epsilon, but really they mean it's a pair of two numbers, a and b. So this plus is just a weird way to write a pair. So if we can, like, you know, as computer scientists, actually represent these numbers as pairs, and we, do the, uh, we define the rules, you see that if I have two pairs and I add them, then I get, you know, 
I add the first parts and I add the second parts. If I multiply them, I multiply the first parts. That's got like, you know, just the multiplication. And then if you see on the right side, you might recognize what, what people call the product rule for differentiation. Maybe you remember that from high school. But again, it's, it just follows by like calculating these things. And then again, the third rule here says, you know, if I apply a function, if I overload the function to take these pairs, it computes both the original value plus the derivative. Ah, some code. I have not seen enough code at this conference. We need more code. There cannot be a talk without curly braces, unless it's about Erlang. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I'm using Scala here. So this is like a direct translation of those rules into Scala. Everybody could have written this, right? It's just easy. Well, there's a dual number. It's just a pair of numbers, the real part and the cap epsilon part. And, you know, you just have to tell them how you add and multiply and divide and how you do sine and cosine. Um, and then I can need to convert a regular number into a dual number. This is everything, all right? So very simple code follows completely from the math. You didn't have to think anything. You can impress all your colleagues by showing this cap, like super cool, like uses Unicode, everything. Um, awesome. Um, now, if you look at these neural nets, they are kind of like, you know, they use sharing. They are kind of like, when people talk about a fully connected net, all these layers are kind of fully connected. So if we look at the simplest of the simplest, exp like, form of a neural net, it just takes a value and it multiplies it and it multiplies the result of that and it uses sharing. So this has got like, you know, the simplest neural net that I can find. So this thing should be able to differentiate an expression that looks like that. So let's look at some expressions here. So first one is just like, you know, standard quadratic equation. And we can, cap, like, you know, in order to find the derivative, we just call that function with the dual number. And we know now that it computes both f of 5 and the derivative of f applied to 5. Now look at the second example. This is a really complicated way to, to compute the sine function. It uses assignments, loops, all the great stuff that we love in programming, right? Loops, assignments, mutable state. Turns out that you can just take the derivative of a function like that. Awesome, isn't it? Um, and then the last one um, builds this chain of um, that, that I showed you, this kind of sharing thing. Of course, it uses some mutable state too, so it kind of like defines a variable, and then it just multiplies this thing with itself. Now look at the, look at the graph here. This is what I was saying that like you know, you, when you run your code, you're not running on a mathematical abstraction because the complexity of, of that last function is linear. So the longer I make that chain, the longer the computation should last. But thanks to the magic of the JVM, look at this. The more I multiply, the faster my code gets. <laughs> oh, isn't that amazing? The JVM is a magical machine. Like, you know, the more work it does, the faster it gets. And then look at those spikes. That's your garbage collector. This is the reason that people like to write C++ in the real world. They don't like the JVM because it's unpredictable, right? But again, like if you don't look at these things and you don't optimize your code and you think it's like a mathematical abstraction, this is what happens. All right, um, now these neural nets have multiple variables, so I need to kind of like extend my code to take multiple parameters. You don't have to understand this code, just observe that the top lines are the same. And then below here, what I'm doing is I'm representing a list of variables as sparse uh, vectors, and then kind of doing point pointwise addition. Uh, sounds all cool, but something bad is going to happen. When we do this, we get quadratic behavior. So if I just take n variables and I just add them up and I want to show off that I still know functional programming, so I use a fold left instead of a loop. Um, when I do that and I run this code, it becomes quadratic. Now, look at this. This graph doesn't have these spikes anymore. So if you want your garbage collector to behave, write quadratic code on the JVM. This is a performance tip from Eric Meyer. All right? Um, but this code is quadratic. It's pretty bad. And um, now, this is not the only uh, time that happened, right? This is an 
excellent blog post here. Like, you know, it's like lots and lots of examples of real world systems that were accidentally quadratic. Now, I remember something from a long, long time ago when I was still a Haskell programmer that there was something with things that were quadratic by accident. And that was when you reverse a list, a list. If you reverse a list in Haskell, that is quadratic. And here, like, you know, here's how you encode lists in, in Scala. You do reverse, and you look at there, it is quadratic. Don't look at the spikes. Isn't that amazing? It's like, you know, look at that spike, the, those spikes. It's just orders of magnitude slower, thanks to the garbage collector. It's crazy. It's 2018. But in, 20, in 1986, John Hughes had a trick on how to um, implement lists using functions. You think that, why would you do that? You, you implement a list, which is something concrete, with a function, something abstract, and what do you get? Suddenly, this quadratic behavior disappears. And let's see how that works. So you represent a function by a list, and, and basically what you do, the trick is that you represent function, um, a list concatenation, which is linear time, by function composition, which is constant time. And then when you want to then turn a function of a list to a list into a list again, you just apply it to the empty list and magic will happen. All right? This is a great trick. Um, and look at this. It works. So if I can like, apply this trick, so you see there that I, I, I represent the list by a function from list to list. Now it becomes a tail recursive. It uses accumulating parameters. But look at that graph. The longer my list that I reverse, the faster the JVM goes. Isn't that amazing? I mean, so again, if you want to make your JVM go fast, just give it more work, and it will run faster. Now here's the question. Can we use this trick for dual numbers as well? Can we get, like, take dual numbers, where we had this quadratic effect, and represent numbers as functions? Then you think, Eric, did you get a package from Amsterdam again? <laughs> Why would you get represent numbers as functions and then think that it goes faster? Well, it's true. But we have to be a little bit more careful. Right? In order to, to get, like, do that, we have to understand that numbers are not monoids. If you want to impress your um, colleagues, you say, yeah, lists are monoids, but numbers are rings. Um, and a ring, like you know, even our president knows that, a ring is just something that has two operations, addition and multiplication. They are both associative and commutative, and they distribute over each other. And so the fact that we're dealing with numbers and we have a ring allows us to represent numbers as functions. And this is how we represent um, lists as functions again. Now let's look at the uh, code that we wrote for dual numbers and see if there's something that resembles lists here. All right? So look at this. We, when we add two things, I'm, I'm now calling the things with the epsilons. This is what mathematicians call tangents. And they get like the normal part, they call primal. But I just use color coding, that's much easier. Um, so there's yellow and black. And you see that if you can like look at the yellow part, it's always of the form something yellow times something black. Right? Huh, let's write down a grammar. A tangent, something uh, yellow, is something yellow times something black plus something yellow times something black, or it's something yellow times something black. That sounds like a list, right? A list is a value concatenated to a list. So all these numbers that we're creating look very much like lists, so we can represent them as functions. Now let's put the multivariate case on the stack for now. Let's first represent Numbers as functions. Ah, oh, isn't that beautiful? Who here would have thought that representing, that you could represent numbers as functions if they're a ring? Um, and here's what you do. You represent a number as a function that takes two parameters, one for the multiplication and one for the addition, and it returns another number. So the representation of A plus B is the representation of A 
and then you pass it R, and then the representation of B. Multiplication is like that, and then we don't need that one. And then the last one, the representation of a number times a constant is the representation of that number, and then you just multiply that constant with the incoming parameter. So that sounds really similar to what we did with lists. All right? So this slide here shows you how to represent numbers as functions. And it's going to make our code faster. Ah, oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Nah, I'm excited. So let's write the code. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep it a little bit simple. I'm not going to do the addition. I'm just going to implement the multiplication by a function. So this is the Scala code. And you just see that like this epsilon has now become a method, which is just a function. And it takes a, fun a, a value, and it returns a value. And it just follows exactly this pattern here. No need to do that. But, ah, when I have functions instead of values, I lose sharing. Because if, say that I have a big list and I concatenate it with itself, now that big list is evaluated only once. But if I represent that list as a function, now that function is shared, but that function will now be applied to two different values, so the computation is duplicated. Ah, uh, so I, I got rid of um, quadraticness in one way, and it pops up in another. So I can show here a simple example where I just kept like build n list, and I kept like you know add a head to each of these lists, and guess what? It becomes quadratic. Now let's look at um, what this means for our dual numbers. Now we're really kept like in in the dumps. Um, let's look at this sharing thing again, which is the thing that we need for um, um, for our neural nets. When I do this, look, it becomes exponential. Oh my goodness, but look how smooth that curve is. Look how beautiful, I mean, this is like straight, like no garbage collection problems, right? Smooth as butter, except that it's exponential. <laughs> All right, so I thought I would take something that was quadratic, turn it into something linear, and what I got was something exponential. Hmm. That's not so good. So should we just quit here and go home? Or do you want to see the rest of the story? Well, this is exactly where the ring comes in. Remember the ring? Remember what I told you about the ring? Have you seen the movie The Ring, by the way? You should. It's really good. Um, anyway, what a ring allows you to do is remember, we're going to implement multiplication by function application. If you look at the expression here on the top, a times b plus a times c, it calls this function a twice, or it does the multiplication with a twice. What the ring allows you to do is, it, this thing is like, you know, it's, it's kind of like chatty. It's, again, this is just like distributed systems. It's, it's multiplying twice, it's chatty. What do we do when we build a distributed system? We make it chunky. So what we do is, we can, instead of doing the multiplication twice, like uh, 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 multiplying b with a and c with a, we can just add B and C together and then multiply it by A. So that is chunky. So this is just chunky versus chatty, common design pattern that we all know. It's called the ring. So now you know, it's like, you know, yes, we should apply the ring principle. Um, chunky versus chatty. So let's make this thing um, chunky. Um, but now what we need to do is we need to take care of sharing because this function that we're calling multiple times, what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of calling it multiple times and then adding the results at the bottom, we're going to take all the parameters, add them first, and then call that function once. So how can I have a function and call it once? Well, two things. First of all, mutable state will save us, as always. Um, and the second thing is, good thing that Facebook is written in PHP, because PHP has this very kind of cool thing, namely reference counting. So we're going to use reference counting to get, like, you know, to get, like, whenever we duplicate this function, we just increase the reference count. And then when we call the function, we decrease the reference count. When the reference count is zero, we know that all the calls to the function are done. And then we can call this function once with this chunky parameter. So you see, you cannot live without mutable state. 
and reference counting is the best invention since sliced bread. All right. So here's the code. Um, let's look at the addition. Nothing much changes, except that when I add two numbers, I'm using these two numbers, so I have to increase their reference count. So that's what you see there. The reference count of A is increased. The reference count of B is increased. Now imagine that you would do this in Haskell. It would have unsafe perform I.O. or suddenly we, suddenly would, we would be in an I.O. monad. No, look at this. Nice mutable state. Just increase those reference counts. And then look at the epsilon there. It has also mutable state because it needs to kind of accumulate these parameters. And then it decreases the reference count. And then when the reference count goes below one, we just call the function. And since I want to be a little bit nice, I just kind of then also kind of like reset all the mutable state back to its initial state such that when the function is called, everything is clean again. All right? And look, when we run our program, it's linear again. Phew! Oh. So no more exponential, but the spikes are back. You cannot have everything. All right. So I promised you that I would kind of like do the multiplication. So this is when you kind of like do it in full um, like ring form, and now it's all tail recursive, except that the JVM doesn't support tail recursion. So if you really want to do tail recursion, you have to implement this using trampolines. Um, but no time for that. Um, and then here is doing the same thing for multiple parameters. If I want to take the derivative of multiple parameters, all right? So this is all very simple code, as you as you saw. Um, it's just like whatever, 25 lines of Scala. Um, then the last thing that I need to do to implement my complete um, deep learning framework in less than 100 lines of code, I need to define what weights are. Well. What we said is that we're going to update the weights based on this the derivative that we're computing. Well, why don't we just kept like you know update the weights immediately? Like if we take the derivative of a weight, we kind of get the incoming value and just multiply the weights already. So a little bit more mutable state to make things even more elegant. All right, so that's it. So we have a complete deep learning framework in hundred lines of Scala, where we used only simple high school math, and we used like this important trick from functional programming where we represent, instead of representing lists as functions, we represent numbers as functions, and then we had to do this trick where we kind of did chunky versus jetty. So that's it. Um, I hope that you, know, you kind of like you know that all the magic behind deep learning is gone. You start with dual numbers, you don't have to invent them. People did that for you 200 years ago. You represent numbers as functions, you don't have to invent that. Some computer scientists, actually, mathematicians invented that trick way before John used it. It's called Cayley's theorem, and it works for any monoid. So that's also like an old trick. Um, then we use sharing using ref reference counting. So again, you cannot, you, know, you cannot make things efficient without mutable state. Um, and then we have derived backpropagation. Everybody here in this room could have done that, right? Because your brains are all bigger than my peanut-sized brain. It's just assembling the right tricks. So um, that's it. Please um, rate this session. But really, don't rate this session. Go and get, like you know, go home on the train and the plane and implement your own deep learning framework. All right. And again, it's not that hard and it's fun. Um, but like you know, it, it was kind of scary that like you know, like you, you think that you fix this and then it becomes exponential and then you. But it's I think like you know, there's no real magic behind this. It's all elementary math with some nice functional programming tricks. Um, and so I hope that was kept, like you know enjoyable, and that you can see kept, like you know that it's useful to know both a little bit of math, and a little bit of functional programming, and of course a little bit of imperative programming. And you need all three. You cannot kept, like you know you cannot live. You cannot remove one. You have to use all three. Um, thank you.